Well, hey everyone, welcome to episode 360 of f Stop Collaborate and Listen with your host, Matt Payne. This week on the podcast, I'm excited to bring you a chat that I had with Scotland-based photographer Marcus McAdam. Marcus is a tour operator and the producer of a YouTube channel called Photography Online. 20 years ago, Marcus left his lucrative radio production job to become a full-time photographer and hasn't looked back. On this week's episode, we discuss his journey, why he chooses analog photography, what all's involved in producing his high quality YouTube channel, and a ton, ton more. I have nothing else to promote this week, so let's get to this week's episode with Marcus McAdam. All right, Marcus McAdam, it's great to have you on the podcast. It's great to be here, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, uh, I'm excited to uh, have this conversation, but I'm also excited to work with you and, and your company on some of my upcoming trips to Scotland. Uh, yeah, when is that? 2025, so October of 2025, yeah. So we got okay. a little bit of time. Yeah, 18 months away. That's right. not, it, it will come around quickly, though. I know, and I'm really excited for it because I've always wanted to go to Scotland, and I have some other friends who live there, like Tim Parkin, so I'm... I'm excited to, to check it out. Yeah, no, Scotland's an amazing place and it, it does draw photographers from all over the world um, for you know, understandable reasons. But um, it's just, uh, it's as much about the light, I think, here than it is about anything else. But we, we also have the, the subjects, the landscapes as well. So the combination of the two, when they come together, you, you could argue that there's no better place you know, on the planet for photography. Plus you have the, the best scotch in the world. Well, you're talking to a non-drinker, so <laughs> I've, I've got no comment on that. <laughs> well, trust me, it's the best. <laughs> okay, I'll take, your, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> All right, brilliant. All right, well, Marcus, for people who aren't uh, familiar with you and what you do, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, so uh, as you've correctly identified, my name's Marcus McAdam. Um, I've been making a, a living from photography for about 20 years now. Uh, previous to that, I was a radio producer, so um, that was my former career. Um, and then I guess the writing was on the wall because this was in the days before the internet. When I was, I mean, I have to backtrack a little bit here, but when I was growing up at school, because there was no internet, the radio was my companion. Yeah. So when I was in my bedroom, um, yeah, I had the radio on all the time. And so I grew up with radio and therefore when I left school, that's where, that's just what kind of like, you know, attracted me to go and, and, and work in that kind of industry. And I, I, I don't know whether it's fortunate or unfortunate, but I managed to kind of get exactly where I wanted to far quicker than I expected. So by the time I was 24 years old, I was producing the biggest radio show, well, certainly in the UK and some would argue in the world. but. <laughs> It, there was nowhere for me to go beyond that because I was already at the top. So if I wanted to stay in radio, the only way that I could have done that and progress would have been to go into management. And that's, mm. just, that's just not for me. I'm, I'm not the kind of person who wants to sit in meetings and discuss budgets. So I'm a creative person. Um, so I basically stayed at the top of the game for about six years. And then the internet came along and I kind of thought, you know, I love this job, but I'm, I know I'm not going to love it forever. And the writing was on the wall with the internet, and I thought this is going to this is going to take a lot of advertising away because it was commercial radio. So here we have the BBC as well, obviously, but this was commercial radio, and I thought that do, that doesn't sound good to me. So I I basically got out and quit my job, and everyone said you're absolutely crazy because I was doing you know, what I thought and what other people thought was the best job in the world. And um, I quit it to become a photographer. Um, and now, you know, 20, 20 years later, that was definitely the right decision because I still know, I'm still in contact with some of the people I used to work with 20 years ago. And they're earning less now than they were 20 years ago. And the industry is such a dire place with everyone fighting over little scraps of budgets here and there. Right. And, um, and you know, I, I, I've never really looked back. So it was definitely the right decision for me. Um, but uh, yeah, so I quit my radio job to become a full-time photographer. But the only thing I really knew was travel photography. Mm. 
and I went to live in Venice for six months to work there. And then I went to China for three months, well, on a three month visa. Um, and I ended up staying for five years. Oh, so wow. um, I overstayed my welcome a little bit there. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it was while I was in China, the, the kind of digital revolution in photography came along. And that then changed things again, because when I was making money from being a travel photographer, I was shooting everything on medium format film. And there was very, very few people who did that. Right. Um, and so that made me stand out in a, you know, a reasonably small crowd. But when digital came along, everybody was suddenly a travel photographer. And it just meant that instead of being able to charge two or three hundred pounds for an image, you were lucky if you could get 20 pounds for an image. Right. People didn't care whether they were on film or not. And, um, and it just, the, the market just literally overnight just went from the travel uh, photography industry. So I kind of sat down and thought, mm, I'm gonna have to rethink this. And uh, I, you know, I will come on to this later maybe, but um, I just decided to give up travel photography, move back to the UK and start a, a workshop business. So I'm now based in Scotland where I run a couple of businesses. Um, one's a, a workshop business and the other one is producing uh, photography media content. Love it. What drew you to photography? I mean, you were in the radio business. Why photography? Well, my father was a graphic designer. Um, and he was very, a, a very arty person. And when I was growing up, I could tell that he was um, clearly disappointed that his son was in no way arty in, <laughs> in, in terms that I couldn't draw. So he was an amazing uh, you know, artist and he could just draw freehand anything. So he's one of, the, one of the very few people who could draw a complete circle freehand every single time. And it wow. would be, I mean, you could get a, 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 you know, a compass on it and go round and, and it was a perfect circle every single time. Wow. And um, yeah, I think when I got to 18, um, I think he probably thought, I'm gonna buy him a camera. Uh, maybe, you know, if he can't draw, maybe he can take a photo. So I'd never shown any interest in photography whatsoever. Um, and just out of the blue, he, he bought me a, a Minolta X300, like 35 millimeter film camera. Back in those days, obviously, you know, again, before the days of the internet or anything, um, there, there wasn't a lot to do back then. So I had this tool in my hands and I thought, I'm gonna learn how to use this properly. And so I just started doing a lot of research, reading books, reading magazines. And I guess I just got bitten by the bug. And, uh, you know, the progress was very slow to start with, but I saw that there was an improvement. If I hadn't saw that there was improvement, I probably would have given up. But there was definitely an improvement there. But it was something that I only did in my spare time because obviously, you know, I had my main job uh, at this time because that's when I started working in radio. That's when I got my first job when I was 18. So photography was really something that I only really did in my you know, holiday time or you know, the occasional day here and there. So it wasn't something that I did that intensively. So it took a long time for me to um, you know, acquire the skills and the eye um, to kind of see that there was a, an improvement there. But yeah, here I am. Uh, well, that was 18, so I'm 53 now. Um, so a lot of years later and uh, I'm, probably getting somewhere <laughs> finally right isn't that funny about photography it's like um you never really know exactly where you stand in terms of kind of your progress as a photographer i mean there's always so much more you can learn there's always more places you can go it's 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 both exciting but also kind of leaves you feeling a little lost at times <laughs> i don't know about you <laughs> No, but that's the great thing about it is that, you know, like you say, you're always learning. And even now, I mean, the learning never stops, but I think I evolve more than I learn now. Mm. So w without wanting to blow my own trumpet, I know pretty much most of what there is to know. Occasionally I'll still learn something. But what I do is I, my interests and my techniques and my style, they evolve over time. Right. And that doesn't make me, that doesn't make me better. Um, but it just it, it just makes me um, it just makes me different, I suppose. And I I think that's very important for anyone who's doing photography over a long period of time to not stay stagnant. 
and mm-hmm. evolve their style and their their interests. So, um, you know, I've got beyond my uh, pretty kind of colourful sunrise and sunset phase now. Um, and that, I, I don't want to be belittle anybody who not, likes to go out and shoot colourful sunrises and sunsets. But for me, that just doesn't do it for me uh, anymore. It did. Um, and I spent years chasing colourful sunrises and sunsets and got really excited if I saw one. Uh, whereas now, I'm probably more likely to just sit and admire it rather than take a photo of mm-hmm. it. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's something that I've noticed in myself. It's not a conscious decision that you wake up one morning and go, right, I'm not going to shoot any sunrises or sunsets anymore. But um, it's just something that I've noticed in my own style in the last two or three years. And I just think, oh, I haven't taken any... I've, you know, I've got two hard drives sitting on my desk here. I don't know how many images I've got on those hard drives, but it's basically 20 years worth of... Well, no, not that long, 15 years worth of work. And there must be maybe 10,000 photos of sunrises and sunsets. Why do I need another one? <laughs> what's, what's the point? What, what, do you, uh, what do you find yourself drawn to now in terms of subject or um, you said there's a new style. What do you, what do you find yourself creating now? Um, well, I've, I've got back into film photography because that's where I started. Um, in film photography and then obviously switched to digital. I was a late convert to digital. Um, so it wasn't until the, the Canon 5D Mark II came out that I thought mm, this this is a camera that I could probably work with now. Um, so that's when I, I kind of got my first digital camera, but I didn't suddenly make the leap and stop using film. I kind of shot both for a while, um, but the convenience of digital um, especially at the time I was doing a lot of commercial photography mm-hmm. and obviously when somebody's paying you to produce content and they want the files digitally which is of course what everybody wants uh, these days so why would you take the photos on film because you're just creating more work for yourself in having to scan right. and you know, develop <laughs> the film and everything so um, for convenience purposes I just found myself shooting digitally all the time and there was a, a period of probably about five or six years where I didn't pick up a film camera at all. And I, I didn't know it, but I was I was missing it, but I hadn't realized that I was missing it. Th- yeah, th- there came a time when I just, I, I don't know what what the, the sort of like the catalyst was, but I suddenly realized that there wasn't an, a challenge for me with digital photography. The cameras had got so advanced that it was almost impossible to get something out of focus or overexposed or underexposed or mess up the composition because you can see it all right there. Where's the challenge in that? And I, I like to challenge myself all the time. And so when when you're taking photos, you know, commercial photos, and you need to provide the, the client with digital files, then obviously there's a reason to shoot digital. But when I'm taking photos for myself, why am I doing that when there's no challenge? And, and so I started shooting on film again because that for me is, is A, it's going back to my roots. Mm-hmm. But B, and more importantly, is it increases the enjoyment of photography because mm-hmm. of the challenge. You know, you can't see what your result is until it's too late. You have to put so much more thought into things like exposure um, and, you know, focusing because you can't, a lot of the cameras I use, you know, might be range finders or large format. And, you know, you've got to focus on a ground glass screen with a loop and everything. And that, <laughs> right. that to me, that is the process. You know, I go out and take photos because I like taking photos. The end result is kind of, it almost plays second fiddle. Okay, if you mm. get a great photo, that's a good bonus. But I, I don't go out to take good photos. I go out to enjoy photography. Mm-hmm. And if I get a good photo, great. That's something maybe to put on the wall or you know, do whatever I need to do with it. But... I need to be enjoying my, my photography. And when, when I'm shooting with a digital camera, you turn it on and you look at the screen, it focuses, you've got a histogram, you go, oh, it's a bit bright, it's a bit dark, adjust the exposure, click, done. Where's the fun in that? <laughs> it's, just, it's, just, it's, just, it's like, I'm sorry, I just don't, I, I, I used to enjoy it, but I don't anymore. So I've kind of gone back to, to using film now. That makes sense. I mean, I, I've, I've always wondered what it would be like to dabble in film. I, I've never really played around in film myself, mostly because I don't find myself getting bored yet with 
photography um most of the time i just get bored with similar subjects so i find that if i can you know mix up the subjects that i'm photographing or the locations that i'm photographing i can kind of keep that curiosity going and that's yeah. enough to drive me but i can totally appreciate that you know if you're sick of photographing the same subjects over and over and over again it's you got to mix it up somehow right <laughs> well absolutely and i think that when i was doing travel photography you know i lived in like i said china i lived in italy i spent a long time in india i spent a lot of time in the us so i've been to over 50 countries and it was photography that gave me the reason to to travel i would never have visited you know 90 percent of the places i visited without the purpose to go there in the first place which was to take photos and if that's your if that's the reason you're doing photography then it doesn't really matter whether you're shooting in digital or film because it's taking you to all those places but i've kind of done that i've got kids now i've got a family and i don't i don't have the freedom to go off and travel around the world endlessly you know with an excuse to take photos so i'm pretty much rooted to the spot and i obviously i still go traveling occasionally with you know looking after groups that we run and everything else but for, for my own personal enjoyment I'm not traveling anymore so photography for me it has to be enjoyable because it's, it's more it needs to give me something more than just a reason to go off and, and travel so if I go out locally just here in Scotland I mean when I say locally it might be five hours away but sure. I'm, I'm talking about not getting on an airplane I have to I have to enjoy the photography and I just find that digital is just too easy and, and, and I don't mean to again I, I really don't mean to put down digital basically saying oh you know films really difficult and digital's easy it's not that but for me I don't learn anything anymore with with digital with film you, you, you turn up at a scene you look with your eyes and you think okay which film am I going to shoot this on and that that's a decision that you never have to make with, right. with digital Right. And so even before you've turned the camera on, even before you've got the camera out the bag, you're looking at the scene and you're going, right, okay, I'm going to shoot this on color positive film because it's got low dynamic range and I'll be able to get everything from the darkest shadow to the brightest highlight you know, on the film. Um, whereas other, other times you'll be thinking, right, I've got to shoot this on you know, color negative film or black and white film for whatever reason. But it's making all these decisions, which for me is the enjoyable part of it. And those decisions, they don't exist with digital. Right. Well, no, I mean, it's like everyone has their own purpose and, you know, what they get enjoyment out of in photography. And I, I have a high level of respect for people that choose to photograph and film. My only pet peeve is when people make the conscious decision to shoot film and then complain about all of its limitations. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, OK, you made the choice to do that. Uh -huh. um, so now you get to live with that choice. <laughs> no, absolutely. But I think I think people who who complain about the limitations, they probably don't understand that the, the well, they, they probably misunderstand what those limitations are, because there aren't that many limitations, really, with film. You just you know if, if you're saying i mean a lot of, one of the most common limitations that people will list is that the dynamic range is too small compared to digital but there are films out there that have got 14 15 stops of dynamic range so just change your film right. but maybe they're not aware of that so you know maybe it's just a you know, a misunderstanding of what the limitations are but what would you say the limitations are oh you know like not being able to see the end result immediately or shutter speed there's definitely limitations on shutter speed like if you're photographing something that's blowing in the wind and you know things like that or you know like the the cost of developing the film yeah i mean the the cost i, I have a theory on the cost and, and that is that i think the film and digital are, are around the same price when you when you weigh everything up right because right. with with film if you're going to go out and buy a decent film camera, and by decent, I'm talking about something, you know, medium format or large format, something that you're going to be able to get a really, really good uh, quality file out of it, um, then you you can get a decent camera with a decent lens for under a thousand pounds or under a thousand dollars. And once you've bought all of your equipment, you then just pay to play, as it were, in that you know you need to buy the film and, right. and develop it. But film cameras don't depreciate. Film cameras don't depreciate uh, in the same way that 
digital equipment does because there's and in fact quite the opposite a lot of film cameras will actually you know uh, go up in value right so if you spend a thousand pounds on a, a camera tomorrow the chances are in five years time it will be worth at least a thousand pounds or possibly even more whereas if you spent a thousand pounds on a digital camera tomorrow in five years time you won't be able to give that away no. <laughs> so, so, so you've lost a thousand pounds. So that's a lot of that's a lot of film that you can shoot. You know, right. and then of course, um, you know, there, there's other lots of other factors to to weigh in in the terms of you know batteries, memory cards, etc. For and, sure. You know, hard there, drives. There's enough, <laughs> yeah, hard drives, all sorts of stuff. You know, you know, uh, cloud, um, you know, right. payments, and all, all sorts of nonsense that you just don't really get with uh, with film. But then you could argue that okay, well, if you're scanning your film, then you still need the hard drives and everything. But with another thing that, or another big difference that I've noticed um, since going back to to shooting film is that I take probably two or three percent of the volume of photos right. I, that I would have taken on digital. For sure. And that extra ninety-seven or ninety-eight percent of photos are completely irrelevant. They're completely surplus to my requirements. I don't need them. All they're going to do is sit on a hard drive somewhere. And, you know, it just means that when I die, my kids have got more files <laughs> to go through. In the, they're, they'll be looking through thousands and thousands of images going, well, we can't just bin this because there might be something useful on it. <laughs> so they're going to have to look through every single file. <laughs> yeah, that's why, like, I just have my print ready TIFF files and you can, like the rest, you can probably just flush down the toilet. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah exactly All right. well so i wanted to kind of reframe my earlier question because i we we you got we got some good stuff there but i was curious like subject wise what are you photographing with the film cameras now yeah uh so subject wise um i would say that i tend to shoot uh kind of decaying things and um old things you know if i see an old car or an old boat I, I almost can't resist getting the camera out and going to going to shoot it. So um, I just I just find that um, there's a there's an extra kind of dimension in subjects like that because they have a story to tell. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I'll give you an example. The other a few months ago, um, I walked into a, there was an old house in the middle of a, the Cairngorms National Park here in Scotland, and. I've been to this house two or three times in order to photograph it and it works okay. It's not the best you know, subject in the world, but if I'm in the area, I'll often swing by and just have a look at it just to check what the light's doing. Uh, and it, it obviously it looks different at different times of year because of the foliage and everything. So um, I've been there like two or three times or had been there two or three times. And adjacent to this house is a, a kind of what looks like a, a kind of a garage um, where, you know, you'd keep a car or something. And I'd never even, never ever bothered looking in it because from the outside, it just didn't look like it held any interest. And then one day I was clearly bored. So I wandered into this garage, which is only big enough to hold, you know, two or three cars. And the, inside this garage, there was, it, it, there was a partition wall uh, and there was a door in the partition wall. And the door was a saloon door with drawing room written across the window. Now, immediately at the moment I saw that, I had to go and get the cameras and photograph it because there was a story there. There's no way that that door belongs in that garage. <laughs> so I don't know what the story is, but you just have to you know, assume that whoever uh, you know, owned that building, they needed a door. And so they, I mean, this would have been the, you know, before the days of the internet. So they would have asked around, anybody got any spare doors? And right. someone would have said, yeah, I've got, I've got an old door that came out of an old ho hotel 20 years ago. And this door's fantastic. So um, just subjects like that really, really interest me because of the backstory to them. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, you know, so it might be an old boat in a, you know, or a boat wreck or an old rusty car in, in I mean, I've just found one here in Scotland the fantastic 1940s car just rusting away in the middle of a forest hmm. and uh and it's it's just such a beautiful scene um and yeah you know, i'm not the first person to discover it but it's not it's not generally well known by the uh the sort of photography community and i'm not i'm not going to ever tell anybody about it 
um, because uh, it's quite a sensitive area in terms of um, there's capercaillie um, nesting there and there's not many of those in Scotland. So um, the last thing I want is for it to be discovered by um, you know, the photography community in, in, in the wider you know, sort of world. And before you know it, there'll, there'll be like workshop groups going there and <laughs> right. um, you know, 12, 12 tripods all lined up next to each other and people you know, tramping through the forest and you know, pe peeing up a tree and all of that nonsense. So, um, <laughs> so you know, it's, not, it's not a secret, but I'm not gonna advertise or, or do anything with those images other than just take them and enjoy them for myself. But that's that's what kind of does it for me. I don't go out looking for old stuff, but as I'm when I'm driving around and I'm you know just got the camera in the car and I'm thinking, okay, what? Well, let's go and see what sort of takes my fancy. It's normally something along those lines which catches my eye. However, um, on that subject, I very rarely go out without a plan as to what I'm going to photograph. You know, I see lot of lots of other people. They grab their bag and they go right let's go out and say take some photos and they've got no idea where they're going or what they're going to take a photo of and that that approach just doesn't work for me so generally my my photography requires a lot of planning hmm. so i live on an island so a lot of it's coastal so the tide might have a massive influence mm -hmm. um in the in the subject obviously the weather at the time of year um all the all of these factors um and there's some uh you know, subjects or some photos that I've been trying to take for six, seven years, and I still haven't managed it because all the all the planets haven't aligned yet. Right. Um, but when they do, um, then of course you know I'll be there and I'll I'll be capturing it. And then of course when someone sees it, they'll say, "Oh, you were so lucky." <laughs> I hate that so much. <laughs> Yeah. And you go, no, no, no. That was seven years in the planning. Luck right. had nothing to do with it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that is the worst, though. Like, uh, it, you know, especially when all of the planets have to align, like you're saying. It's, and if it's if it's a hard to reach location, it's you know, yep. there's even more that goes into it. And... But but okay. So when you when you factor in that I'm shooting, I'm, I'm I choose to shoot on film because I want the challenge. Okay, I want to make it as difficult as possible. I choose these very ambitious photos where you can't just turn up every day and take the shot. You have to wait for you know, all these planets to align. And that's what I love. I, I, I purposely try and make it as difficult as I possibly can for myself because the reward when you achieve something is so much greater. Mm -hmm. you know, no, the I, sense I of agree. satisfaction that you get from having tried to get an image you know, 30 times and failed that 31st time that you actually get what you hoped you, you got that's so much more uh, rewarding and satisfying than if you just go out and take a shot and get it first time I mean you could just photoshop it <laughs> we'll talk about that later <laughs> yeah don't get me started on that <laughs> uh, well we'll talk about that later but um, you know I, I want to really learn a lot more about your YouTube channel, which you call Photography Online. Yeah. What is it about? Who's it for? And what do you hope to accomplish with it? Okay, so um, I'll tell you how it came about. And, and I've already alluded to the fact that when I was, um, you know, growing up and got this first camera, the way that I taught myself, um, you know, how to advance my photography skills was I, I would go out and I would buy magazines photography magazines now normally in the UK these were monthly publications and there were two or three of them and I used to buy them every single month and I'd read them from cover to you know front cover to back cover um, and what was good about those is that I had at the time the only subject which really interested me photographically was landscapes mm -hmm. however reading through these magazines of course there's a couple of articles about landscapes but then you turn the page and there's an article about you know how to shoot a bowl of fruit on a table on a rainy day i've got no interest in shooting a bowl of fruit on a table on a rainy day but i would read it nonetheless and what that would do is it would expand my you know knowledge of other areas of photography and occasionally you'd you'd read an article and you think actually that sounds quite interesting i might give that a go and so 
reading these magazines, not only did they help me improve my knowledge uh, of photography and my, my skills, but they also broadened my you know, appreciation or understanding of, of what else I could do with cameras. What I'm trying to do with photography online is replicate what I experienced with magazines back in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, you know, because the internet didn't exist. Now the internet exists. All these magazines, they don't longer, they, they, they went bankrupt years ago because people stopped buying them. Mm -hmm. Because people could just go online and, and look on YouTube or wherever it is and they don't need to go and buy a magazine. So there, some of them, there are magazines that do still exist, but none of the ones that I used to read still exist. So uh, initially I thought someone must have modernized the photography magazine and it must be online so I went looking for it and I couldn't find it anywhere and in my search I then discovered lots of YouTube uh, you know programs sure and uh, and I was watching them I was thinking I can't believe how bad these are <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm one of those people that if I ever hear somebody else complaining about something and they haven't mm. and they're not doing anything about it it kind of slightly gets my back and so I thought, I can't possibly sit here and complain about how bad all of this is because I'm not doing any better myself. So I thought, right, I'm going to give it, if it doesn't exist already, I'm going to give it a go. So um, this was um, probably 2018 mm -hmm. that um, I started putting, you know, the wheels in motion for this thing. And I knew that I couldn't do it myself. It wasn't um, a, a one man job. I needed a team of people. Well, fortunately, I already had that because... You know, I've got a team of people that work in my other businesses here. So I already had the team of people. The only person I didn't have was a presenter. So I wanted a magazine format show with a presenter linking different features within one show. So it's almost like turning the pages of a magazine. Mm -hmm. And uh, you get the, you know, right at the beginning of the show, you get the contents, right? Coming up in this show, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and we're going to do this. And so you know exactly what's coming up and I needed a presenter um, and Ruth uh, Taylor who was doing the breakfast show on the local radio station here on the Isle of Skye I'd kind of done a couple of photography jobs with her um, you know previously so I, I, I kind of knew who she was she knew who I was so I just approached her and I said listen have you ever done any, any, any visual presenting um, she said she hadn't but she was interested in trying it so um, yeah, so we just got together and uh, Ruth's now, you know, a full time member of the team. And, um, you know, she comes out and she um, helps to lead workshops and, and everything else. So um, she's kind of come a long way since my initial, you know, involvement of, of her in, in the show. Um, but yeah, so that's that's essentially what it is. That's why it exists, because I just thought that I want to give people who are learning photography today the same platform that I had when I was learning photography but bring it into the you know the digital era or the online era so we all, all we're doing basically is trying to recreate the photography magazine of the 1980s and 1990s and bring it into 2020 now I had all of 2019 to work on this and the, the launch was at the beginning of 2020 and the idea, the original idea, was that the first two or three shows were going to be really big production um, and, you know, try and pull in as much of the audience as possible. And then we were going to kind of take our foot off the pedal a little bit um, and just go to something that was sustainable on a monthly basis. Um, we all know what happened at the beginning of 2020. OK, so we launched the show in January. That was January 2020 was our first show. Uh, we'd only got as far as our second show and bearing in mind I'd had a year to work on on those two shows so they were they, they were kind of pretty much where I wanted them to be at the time and then of course March came along and the whole world got locked down so all of our uh, workshops and photo holidays just ceased to exist and I found myself with a lot more time on my hands than I'd planned um, but the one thing that I could continue doing was photography online because it didn't involve you know being in an enclosed uh, space with people um, and it, you know there was a lot of people 
that were thirsty or hungry for content at that time because they were all sitting at home unable to do anything anyway. So it seemed like the perfect opportunity to try and you know establish the the brand as it were. Um, and I because I had so much time to put into it, the production level stayed way higher than I ever imagined it to be. And it stayed that high pretty much for the whole of the first year. And then of course, we came out of lockdown. So all the trips and all the workshops started. But I kind of um, dug my own grave, if you like, with it, because I couldn't, after a year, I couldn't then start backtracking and going you know, to a, a worse level of production because everyone would go, oh, this, this isn't as good as it used to be, I'm off. Right. So I had to sustain that level of, or try to sustain that level of production. Um, but it was almost impossible because it's so much work, way more than people um, who, or anyone who doesn't do it, you know, YouTube, no one appreciates how much work goes into, into that, especially when you're doing a lot of it yourself. So <clears throat> when the workshops and the, the trip started, I was basically working 16 hour days, trying to do everything and keep the production levels up. And I kind of managed to get away with it. Uh, but by the, end of, <clears throat> by the end of 2022, um, I just, it was, I was a losing battle because the moment you finish one show, um, you then had a, a trip to do, which took you away for 10 days. Right. Um, and then by the time you came back from that trip, the deadline for the next show was only four days away and you got nothing. You have to start from scratch and you just think, well, I can't produce a good show in four days. It's, it's impossible. And so we took the decision to not put any output out in 2023 whatsoever, but continue working. So for all of last year, I was working as hard as I ever have done, but because we weren't outputting anything, I've been building up this bank of, of stuff. And we've only just started putting that stuff out this year in, in so January. This year was the first, the first show of the new season. Um, and so the production level is now higher than it's ever been. Um, but my ambitions now, are to make it the the kind of like the industry standard photography show. So the, the one that, you know, everyone sort of judges everything else by. So um, in order to do that, we obviously need, you know, to have a, a, a sizable audience, um, but we also need the backing of the industry, but we're kind of getting that now. So, um, you know, a lot of the sponsors that we've got, are, you know, the big time players like Sigma, um, you know, Ilford, um, there's, there's lots of what well, I'm trying to avoid the, 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 the camera brands, because if you start working with, say, you know, Nikon or Nikon, as you would say, um, then if, if you've got a feature that's sponsored by Nikon, everybody who's got a Sony camera or a Canon camera or a Fuji camera, they kind of go, oh, this is not for me because it's, it, we're not, we're not talking about their brand of camera. Whereas if it's sponsored by Sigma then Sigma will make lenses for every camera. So mm -hmm. it, it's psychologically... <laughs> Except for the Canon. <laughs> That's well, a whole other thing. Th yeah, th they're working on it. But, right. <laughs> um, but the, the fact is that everybody can have a Sigma lens. And so it, it's kind of like we're, I'm trying to work with, with brands that, doesn't, or that don't alienate people, or at least too many people. But with the backing of the industry um, and you know, the right volume of, of viewers... I'm just trying to get it to a level where everybody sort of sees it as the industry standard kind of photography magazine show, basically. All right. So you, you, you alluded to the fact that it takes a tremendous amount of effort to produce the content that you're creating for photography online. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what all is involved in producing that high level content. Yeah. So, um, well, let me run you through a list of what every single feature so each show has four is made up of four features now and that this is something that's new for 2024 so previously there was no kind of set format we just fill a, a show up with as many features as it needed whereas now it's the same features on every single show so we always start off with a photo challenge um, which is entertainment led but uh, in that entertainment led feature there'll also be a lot of you know, practical advice and learning from, you know, example uh, and, you know, passing on skills, etc. Then we have uh, another one which is uh, called our essential camera skills, which is uh, a tutorial style uh, feature. 
After that, we have a special feature, which is everything that doesn't fit into any of the other categories. And then we end each show with a, a film uh, analog affairs, so a film feature. Hmm. Um, so, but that doesn't mean to say that it alienates anybody who's shooting digital, because a lot of the time we might be talking about depth of field or we might be talking about composition. Mm-hmm. It's just that I happen to be using a film camera to do it, that's all. Sure. So there's still a lot of technique that anybody can, can you know, pick up from watching that last uh, you know, feature. But um, you know, sometimes it's about developing film or how to use a light meter, which is obviously you know, specific to, to film. Um, but each one of those features okay, starts off with an idea. So that's you know, sitting down and thinking, okay, let's, let's get an idea um, on paper as to what this feature is going to be about. Once you've got the idea down, you then need a script. Every single feature that we do is scripted. So even though it might not be obvious, some of them are, script, are scripted 100%. Others are, are kind of partially scripted and they leave room for conversation between you know, more than one person. But if it's just one person in the feature, then that's 100% scripted. Um, obviously, if it's conversation, you, you, can't, um, you can't script that. So you then need to write the script. You then need to think about a sponsor because if a sponsor wants to get involved, that's going to affect the script. So you don't want to go too much further. So if, I'll just give you an example. If I'm doing an analog affairs uh, thing and I'm using Ilford film, I'll contact Ilford and I'll say, listen, we're going in this feature. Do you want to sponsor it? They've never said no <laughs> when I've come up with it because I'll only, I'll only pitch stuff to them that I think is beneficial to them. I'm not trying to you know just sell them, you know, something that they're not going to be interested in so um, they've always said yes so once I know that they're interested I then think right okay well when I'm filming this I need to get Ilford brand in the shots um, and I write it I'll change the script slightly um, according to that once we've got all that done we then need to film it which is fairly straightforward Um, although the filming might be on the other side of the world so it's not always straightforward you might then have to book flights hotels and everything else Um, Once you've got the footage, you then come back and you edit it. Um, Once you've got everything in the right order and it's telling the right story, we then add the music. Now, the music is really important. And I get uh, uh, one of the, um, I wouldn't say common uh, kind of complaints, but it does come up reasonably often, is that someone says, why do you have to use music under everything? And... I always explain to them, if the music wasn't there, you probably wouldn't be watching because the music does so much more than just be music. It, it allows me to create atmosphere. It allows me to punctuate things. It allows me. So going back to when I was a radio producer, this is my mind working Okay, here. So I use music to dictate the pace of the feature to you know, put punctuation points in. So every time when, when you watch one of our features, you'll notice that every time something happens, there's a punctuation point in the music. So everything is edited to the music. Mm -hmm. I haven't just put a music bed underneath it and thought, oh, that that, leave that, that will do. So putting the music underneath, it takes a massive amount of time because first of all, you need to pick the right music because if you pick the wrong music, then you're just making your life very, very difficult for yourself. Um, So you need to pick the right music. Now, you know, sometimes that can be quite difficult other times it just tends to happen relatively easily Um, but once you've chosen the right music then you have to edit everything to be in time with the music or edit the music to be in time with with you know what's happening on visually so that's where my sort of radio production skills come into effect Um, once you've got everything working well with the music um, we then have to add the graphics there's a lot of graphics on the screen that say you know information whatever it is Um, so they will need to be added then everything needs to be graded so for anybody who's never done video work before um, imagine coming back from a trip and having 3,000 photos to edit in Lightroom that's the typical amount of work that you have to do on a show of photography online because every single clip that you see has to be graded separately from the next clip and from the next clip. So they each have to be done individually to ensure that the color balance is um, the same all the way through, that you've got proper contrast, um, basically just tweaking it so it, it looks as good as it possibly can. Then you have to so process the sound. So, you know, 
the one thing that we always get positive feedback on is that you know they say how do you make your show sound so good well hopefully that's just because of my radio you know background but everything gets processed properly so that um, even though we do have music underneath it you can hear what's being said and the music might be quite loud but you can still hear what's being said over it so everything's processed compressed EQ'd um, so that it all sounds as good as it possibly can once that happens I then because this is all me doing this by the way um, so <laughs> once that happens I then invite the others so if um, you know Ruth might um, be involved at this stage or um, it might be my colleague Harry or my colleague Nick or my colleague James whoever's presenting the feature um, I'll invite them in to watch it and get their feedback from it um, and then once we're happy I then export it it then needs to be watched again because when you export something sometimes little gremlins get into the system and it doesn't right. export it the same as what you've seen so even though you've just spent an hour watching a show you then export it and you have to spend another hour watching it again and sometimes you might find something that's just one second where something went wrong and you have to export the whole thing again and then start again and watch the whole and <laughs> it, it's just unbelievably boring but I've I've watched some shows seven or eight times. I had to watch them seven or eight times before they even get uploaded to YouTube. And by the time they go out on the air, I'm so sick of them. It's unbelievable. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, uh, but before, before we release them onto YouTube, we then have to do the subtitles because most people who upload stuff to YouTube, YouTube auto, auto generates the subtitles. But there's so many mistakes in it and with you know some of our Scottish accents I know I'm not I don't have a Scottish accent but Ruth does and Nick does it doesn't quite get the uh the the Scottish accent so sometimes I mean there's there's some really humorous ones actually so uh, <laughs> Ruth will always end every show by saying take good care but most of all take good photos it's just our kind of sign off thing that we've always done and there's a couple of times where even though she said take good care but most of all take good photos the um, the auto generation of the subtitles says take nude photos <laughs> so you have to check this stuff you can't, you can't just let YouTube do, do its thing so and also it doesn't punctuate it either so we have to go through and we have to punctuate everything we change everything that's wrong which is about 15% of the of the stuff that's wrong and so that can take four or five hours to, to do the subtitles for an hour long show um, and and then you need a thumbnail as well, you know? And that's, by the time you get to the thumbnail, you're kind of done with it, you know? And, and you, the the the, um, the temptation is to just kind of think, oh, just anything will do. But the thumbnail is so important. That's the front cover to the magazine, you know? So if that's not right, it doesn't matter how good the show is, nobody's gonna watch it because no one's gonna click on it. So just when you, you, you think everything's done, you still then have to think of the thumbnail. And sometimes we might do 10 thumbnails and we'll send them out to people and we'll go, which one are you, which one were you most likely to click on? And oh you know, whatever the, I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, you know, and that's just one show. And then you get that out of the way. And then before you know it, the next deadline's only two weeks away before you've got to get the, another, <laughs> the next show out. Right. So it's incredibly time consuming. And I've worked it out that for, for this year, 2024, if you watch one minute of content on photography online that represents about 10 hours of work that's not so so it, it for, for the hour-long show it's about 600 hours of of work which includes writing the script and and doing everything and i obviously some shows are more time intensive than others um, some cost more than others but as an average each show is about 600 hours worth of work and it costs between 5,000 to 8,000 pounds per show. And that's, and, and, that's, and that's why, that's why <laughs> no one else is doing it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least not to that degree, for sure. I mean, I, I mean, I, we were talking before this, we started and you were asking me about YouTube for the podcast and, you know, I started doing that a year ago, but I mean, I have so little extra time to be able to devote to all of the things that you're talking about that mm. I feel lucky if I can just 
get it produced and edited and, you know, put some photos overlaid into the episode and, you know, get it out into the world. But I'm also doing it every single week and I'm in, but I, and I'm the only person on my team. It's just not like I have, you know, a staff of six other people helping sure. me out. But I mean, even still, that's, yeah, I, I pr- completely appreciate the amount of effort that goes into creating a quality product. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the most common um, kind of comments that we get is that the show isn't for YouTube. And I, I, I take that as a compliment. Basically, you know, YouTube was designed for, um, you know, people to make low quality content. So, um, you know, when I, when I grew up as a kid, I had three TV channels to, to choose from. This is before the days of cable TV or satellite TV. So there were three three uh, channels that you could watch on TV, and the the production quality was phenomenal in those days. It was much better than it is now because it was television made made by the few for the many. But now we live in a world where television is made by the many for the few, if that makes sense. So we we kind of swapped it swapped it around a bit, and I've noticed that since lockdown, particularly, um, even you know, broadcasters like the BBC, um, which are, you know, renowned for having the very, very highest, you know, threshold for what's acceptable. Um, before lockdown, they would never have put somebody on a webcam on on, on television because the, the quality just wasn't, wouldn't be there. Whereas now it's kind of seen as acceptable to, to do that. And so mm-hmm. the quality of all broadcasting has come right, right down. So I'm kind of, um, you know, trying to fight... <laughs> fight the trend and doing what I can. And you know, I'm on very low budgets. I've got, you know, limited, um, you know, staff and limited facilities, but I'm doing what I can to produce the very best uh, quality content. And lots of people say it's it's TV production quality and it shouldn't be on YouTube. But I just take that as a, as a compliment rather than get involved in a conversation as to where it should be. Because if it was, if it was taken to another level and, 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 you know, some television company signed, you know, signed me up and said, right, we'll, we'll do it for a, a year. It would completely change because all of a sudden you'd have 20 people working on it. Um, whereas at the moment it's kind of like a cottage, you know, industry and I can keep control of everything. Whereas if there was a group of people working on it, then I'd have to just delegate things and just accept that they weren't going to be how I wanted them. Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting because my philosophy, which I'm, I I don't know, I could be completely wrong, but I find that as long as the information is of high quality and the content is of value, I think a lot of people are willing to overlook, you know, production value um, Mm -hmm. if they're getting value out of the content. And that's kind of where I've put, you know, I'm, I'm all in on that kind of concept. But some of that's just out of necessity for myself. <laughs> sure, no, and, and that's what YouTube is for, you know. So we're almost photography online is is kind of out of place, really, for YouTube. But it has to be somewhere, and uh, to make it accessible to everybody, YouTube's as good as anywhere else. Um, you know, it certainly gets it out there available for anybody to watch. Um, whereas if we were hosting it on our own website, for example, um, then obviously it'd be much more difficult for people to to discover it. So mm-hmm. it's it, it serves it serves a purpose for now, but um, but you know I'm just I, I'm a I'm a perfectionist, and um, you know when I used to do radio production, I didn't get where I got to by doing things or having the attitude of that will do. I had to go, I, you know, not not to just level the best person, but to beat the best person, and so. That's kind of what I'm doing here. Is is like I'm I'm setting I'm trying to set new standards as to what can be possible, um, but with the with the sort of safety of knowing that nobody can ever try and compete with me because no one else has a team of people and no one else has five thousand pounds and six hundred hours a month to spend on it. <laughs> so I'm in a, you know I'm in a quite a nice position to know that um, you know it's unlikely that someone's going to come along and and compete with me and, and, you know, give uh, viewers an alternative thing to watch. It makes sense. How do you uh, keep your content fresh for your audience? I, I find for a podcast, especially it's, it's a little bit challenging, you know, coming up with 
new ideas or new topics or new things that would keep your audience engaged? Yeah, I've, I've never had a problem with that. I mean, I've got a long list. Um, it's about three pages of A4, and it's quite small font, um, of just of ideas. And I find that the list gets longer and longer rather than shorter and shorter. So obviously, as, as I record stuff, I take it off the list because once we've done it, we've done it. But for everything that comes off the list, probably two or three things go on the list. So when I'm driving around or when I'm out on a, a workshop with people, um, some, someone might say something and I'll think, that would be a great feature. And I just write it on my phone because if I don't, then two days later I'll go, oh, what was, what was right. that idea again? And I beat myself up because I think, oh, damn it, that was a really good idea and I can't remember. Um, so I always write it in my phone. So my phone's got loads of notes in it and then I transfer them to the, the, the list of ideas. But um, I've got, I mean, if, if I was forbidden for adding anything else to the list of ideas, I've probably got enough content for three or four years. So it, you know, I don't struggle with, with what to do. But some, some things will get put on the list and you'll just find that they're, they sit there for two or three years and they don't really do anything. And, and I, I then take them off because I just think, if it, if it was good enough, it would have been done by now. Right. And so unless there's a reason, um, it might be a budget reason or, or whatever, um, then, uh, you know, for, I'll give you an example. Three years ago, I had an idea to do a, uh, a photography challenge where we drive around the UK and we have to go to all the national parks in one week to photograph them for a calendar. Now, that idea was on the... the, the the ideas list for a long long time and the only reason why it never came off the ideas list is because of budget reasons you know you, you need four people um to take a week out of the diary so that means no workshops no trips nothing so there's, there's no money coming in um we then got to hire a camper van for a week you then got the fuel you then got the food you then got everything so to to shoot that across a week i mean it was phenomenal and that was the reason why it never came off the, the list until this year. And now this year we've, we've done it. Or you know, Last year we filmed it and it's going out this year. Um, but, you know, that just kind of shows the amount of, you know, dedication and effort that's involved in doing what we do. I love that. So earlier you talked about what it's like a little bit to work with sponsors. I'm curious um for you more specifically what is the nitty-gritty of working with sponsors and how have you gone about uh getting them involved in your project yeah so i mean uh, you know historically we've kind of gone down the same route that everybody else goes down in that you end up with an agency normally contacting you once you get to a certain about a, a certain volume of of viewers you, you kind of start popping up on radars and um, and you'll get agencies contacting you saying, um, you know, we can give you this much money if you do this and do this. And we've we've done it in the past because you have to, you know, you, you've got to make the money back somehow. So we've kind of taken on, you know, sponsorships from things like VPNs and stuff like that because they pay you £2,000 and you think it's only a minute of the show. Um, and, you know, people will just skip past it anyway. So we'll just take the money because we need it. Um, but... <laughs> That, that that was all in the past and um you know so now we've, we've got a very different attitude now in that we won't allow the integrity of the show to be uh damaged in any way by a sponsor so if a vpn came to us and said you, you, we want to work with you the answer is no i don't care about the money the answer is just no because nobody watches our show for to get information on a vpn Okay, so you won't see us sponsored by Skillshare or Squarespace because we people just aren't interested in that stuff. Mm -hmm. So we we're now working directly with sponsors, and we'll only work with sponsors who we can tie into the features. So um, you know, people like Think Tank, um, you know, Ilford Sigma, um, and the, for for the photo challenge um, for for this year, the one where we driving around the UK trying to uh, photograph all the national parks. Because it's a race against time, we thought, what, what better brand than a watch company? And so we've, we've got a watch sponsor. Now it's got nothing to do with photography, but it's got everything to do with the feature because it's, the clock is always ticking and we're trying, it's a race against time. So it's almost like they're, keep, they're doing the timekeeping for us. And when you go outside of the photography community, 
um, in you know, looking for sponsorship, you find that there's far bigger budgets. Mm. So if you go to you know uh, name any photography brand, okay, and you will find that their budgets are minute when it comes to advertising on YouTube. They're just not interested. They they might give you you know free loan of a camera for a, for six months or something like that. It's just it, it, it's not going to make any difference to us. Whereas you know we're talking about trying to claw back some of this five to eight thousand pounds that it costs to, to produce every single show they're not going to be able to do that so you have to go outside but nobody watching is going to get offended because we've got something that's a race against time sponsored by a, a, a watch company right so you know we're we're pulling in the money which is paying for the show or part paying for the show it doesn't cover the whole show but it's part paying for the show um but it's not um, ruining the integrity of the, of the of the viewing experience for the audience. Yeah, and I think that's an important consideration. I've always found that I always found it strange with podcasts or YouTube channels where they have just some random sponsor that has absolutely nothing to do with the episode or nothing to do with what they're yeah, teaching. I, I mean, it's I just, get it. I get it. Everyone needs to make money, but you know, we've just drawn a line in the sand and said right that's not we've done it we, um, so I'm not knocking anybody who does it because um, we've done it ourselves but not anymore so if, from now on everything that um, that we get sponsored will be closely tied in with the brand and um, you know it, it, it works it works both ways that way because they can provide prizes as well so um, you know if you're sponsored by a VPN and they say well we want to give away you know, a hundred VPNs for free. Whoopie do. No one's going to care. You know about that. Whereas if you're giving away five think tank bags, then everyone's interested in that because everybody wants a camera bag. Right. No, that makes makes total sense. What um what have you found being useful in terms of finding a way to reach those uh, sponsorships in terms of figuring out the ask and figuring out like is it worth your time those kind of considerations yeah well i mean this is going back to my experience working in radio production really where um i was you know the radio station i used to work for it employed 250 people so some of those people would be in sponsorship and they their job would be to sell um you know ideas and sh and shows to to sponsors but I had to make the the show reel because they would come to me and they say, Marcus, we need a three minute show reel to pitch to Foster's Lager um, because we want to get them to sponsor the show. Can you go and make something? So I'm using those skills that I learned in radio for now. So I make show reels um, for the show to because if we just cold call somebody um, and say, listen, we produce a YouTube program. You can almost hear over the phone their eyes rolling in the back of their <laughs> head, thinking, "Oh God, these," <laughs> you know. And in order to in order to explain to somebody properly what we do, you have to demonstrate it physically in form of a, a, a demo. So I will then send them a link and just say, "Look, this is a three minute demo of exactly what we do and what we can be doing for you." Um, and in that demo, it has it, it says what the show is who we are um, and s tells them about our demographic, you know, who's watching us, what age they are, where they are in the world, um, all the information that they, they want to know for their brand. Um, and so I, I don't think, I wouldn't imagine that there's any other YouTubers out there doing that mm -hmm. because they don't, they don't have the, the, the background skills to do that or they don't understand how the industry works enough to do that. Yeah. So I just find it's, far more rewarding to deal with people directly. So as well as writing the scripts, doing the filming, um, you know, doing the editing, mixing all the music, I'm also the sales and sponsorship department as well. <laughs> nice. All right, well, Marcus, let's shift gears a little bit. I know that a large part of your work and your business um, entails helping out with the logistics for international photography workshops in Scotland and other areas. Uh, what all is involved in keeping that part of your business sustained? Um, yeah, so th I mean, this started out a, a little bit by accident, really, because it was never intentional. So um, I don't know how many years ago it was. Um, it would have been maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, and at the time, 
we were just doing photography workshops on the Isle of Skye, which is where I'm based. Um, as it happens, it just it just so happens to be probably one of the best places in the UK and Scotland for photography. So it brings in a lot of photographers anyway. But that's why we're based here. I'm not didn't suddenly wake up one day and find myself living on the Isle of Skye. I chose chose to do it. Um, but we had a customer um, from Switzerland, and she owned her own photography workshop company. Um, and she came over here, and we took her around just for a couple of days. Uh, and she said, "Look, if I bring a group of eight photographers can you provide the the local expertise and the and and the logistics so we said yeah that's no no problem at all so we started doing it for for her and it went really really well and we did it for a couple of years we never really made any big mistakes but we learned a lot over those couple of years of you know how we could do things better and once i thought right we're, we're doing this well now um i then started approaching other people like munch workshops um and said look this is what we can do. I'm just making you aware of, of, of our existence, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we started working with lots of other people as well. And it's got to the point now where we're running probably 15 to 20 trips a year um, for various companies who come from all over the world. They come from Australia, Canada, the US, uh, Switzerland. Um, we've got one coming from Italy soon. Um, and yeah, it's great that they all want to come to Scotland, but as we, we're branching out even further than that because for Munch workshops now, um, you know, we provide the logistics for their island trip and also their Spain trip. Um, and we also do the Dolomites for a couple of other companies as well. So we're kind of like branching out into, into Europe. And I think the reason why we're able to do that is because I don't think there's anybody else out there that does it. Mm -hmm. I, there's no one that I know of that because you, you need a team of people um, you can't just do this uh, you know as a one man band so you need a team of people and you need and you have to have the vehicles as well so um, you know I've got five um, eight seater kind of luxury minibuses for want of a better word uh, you know they're all sitting out there doing nothing at the moment because at the moment it's not the season for um, for photo tours but there'll be another you know when they all start up again um, they'll all be out on the road um, and you know it's a massive investment but it kind of is better than hiring vehicles because when you hire a vehicle um, you can't guarantee that it's going to be um, of the right standard um, so sure. all of our all of our vehicles are, are very high spec they've all got leather interior they've got USB charging points for every single seat so that people can charge their cameras and more to the point, we've got masses of room in, in, uh, in the back for people's bags and the, you know, their luggage and their camera bags and their tripods. If you hired a, a nine-seater vehicle um, from you know, Alamo or you know, Eurocar or whatever, you can't guarantee that you're going to get that space behind the Because some, some nine-seaters, you've got the back row right up against the back door. That's right. And you think, okay... I can see how I can get nine people in this car, but where does their luggage go? Right. And so you, you go to the airport to pick up the group of people and you, you have to tell them actually you can come, but your luggage has to stay here. It's just not going to work. So we have to have our own vehicles. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it, to, to start a company from scratch to offer that kind of service, um, you know, with five vehicles and a team of five professional photographers who know the locations, because that's the key, is that you can't have a guide who doesn't know the locations photographically, um, you know, it's our job to get these people in the right place at the right time, using our local knowledge, looking with our eyes at what the conditions are mm -hmm. and going, right, it's overcast today, but there's no wind. I know where we can go, which will work perfect in these conditions. And so there's nobody else that can do that. So you need a team of five professional photographers who've got intimate knowledge of the area and the vehicles as well. I don't know anybody else who does that? I mean, there may be somebody else that does it. There's certainly no one else in the UK that does it. But there might be someone in Europe that does it, but probably not. And that's why um, so many people end up coming to us because we're kind of offering a unique service. But um, but it works. It works really well, and uh, it's nice for us to you know just be working with different people throughout the year because it doesn't matter what job you do or how good your job is. If you do it too much, then it becomes a bit of a chore. Whereas I think by keeping a, by keeping the the job varied, 
um, then it just makes it a lot more interesting. Mm -hmm. And that goes to say, that's not just photography, that goes for anything. You right. Know? So I mean, going um, back to like so, when you left radio, right? I mean, that's, you were like, I've kind of exactly. accomplished I mean, everything. Best, you know, <laughs> I, I was flying around the world interviewing the biggest people in the music industry. Um, and then having to, you know, go back to London and edit it and, uh, and, you know, make it sound great and put it out and there'd be millions of people listening to it. It was a fantastic job. Um, and I walked away from it and was told that I was crazy. But um, if I'd carried on doing it, I would, I'd, I'd be, well, I think I'd just be a, a shell of a human by now. Right. Because there, there'd be no sad, there, there'd be no sense of satisfaction in that job anymore because it would never have been as good as it was. Yeah. Along those same lines, I'm curious, uh, what are some of the toughest challenges that, that you face today for, for running a photography business? Organizing the calendar <laughs> is, the most, <laughs> is the most difficult thing because you know, going back to these, uh, these overseas um, workshop companies that come to Scotland or wherever it is, obviously we only have a, you know, a finite number of guides and a finite number of vehicles. So they can't all come at the same time. Um, and it's trying to talk people into, you know, you don't really want that week because the next week, that, that week's normally got the best weather <laughs> and it's not, got nothing to do with the weather it's just because that's when our, our gap is in the diary. But what, what I would love to do, and I just don't have the, um, I don't, well, I don't have the balls to do it basically, is that the best light here in Scotland, without a shadow of doubt, is between December and February. However, it's unreliable. And so when people say to me, what's the best time to come to Scotland for, for photography? If I was being blatantly honest, I would say December to February, because that's when the best light's gonna happen. However, that's only because I live here and I can react to the light mm -hmm. at any time. But if you're coming to, to the Isle of Skye for five days, right. and you're coming between December and February, you might not see anything except for sideways rain right. and, <laughs> and, and fog, you know? Right. And, and, and so, I can never suggest that to somebody because if they do come and they get horrendous conditions, which is, I wouldn't say it's likely, but it's possible, mm -hmm. then they're going to go, why did you tell us to come at this time of year? What's going on? Right. So when people say that they want to come in May, I personally, I consider May to be quite a dull month in terms of it's settled weather, it's normally sunny, it's the driest month of the year, um, and it's great to be outdoors in. People enjoy it, but for photography, it's pretty useless because the light's <laughs> bland, the days are too long, you know, the sun rises at 4.30 or about five o'clock um, and it sets at 9.30. So it interferes with dinner times, the, the, the sunset when everyone wants to be out. Everyone gets tired because they're setting their alarm uh, for four o'clock in the morning and they're not going to bed until 11 o'clock at night. So you do that for a few days and everyone starts getting grouchy and start, you know, just not being the, yeah. the the good thing about these these trips is that you see the best and the worst of people you know so you <laughs> see the best of them because you're taking them to all these fantastic places you're so right <laughs> so, some of them have some of them have just longed to go to these places and they're like bucket list ticks and they go there and they're just so excited and so you see the the you know the best side of people but then you also see the worst side of people because they're tired they're hungry they're cold they're wet Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it just it brings out the, the, the extremes. But that's that's also a really important part of the job is is to manage people properly. Mm -hmm. Lots yeah. of people who who don't do, um, you know, photo or group workshops because it, doing an individual workshop and a group workshop are two completely different things. And so one of the I'd say one of the most, if not the most important part of doing a group workshop is managing the people. Mm -hmm. Forget about the photography. It's managing the people that's the the, the most diff and people don't really realize that because it's going on in the background all the time. You don't you don't make that bit obvious. So You're, yeah, um, I mean, and, and to your point, I mean, you think about nature and landscape photography specifically. Most people who are really into it are kind of introverted. They don't really like people. They don't like dealing with people. And so when you start thinking about a checklist of what would make for a really good workshop instructor. You know, like there's not realistically a lot of people who uh -huh. check all those boxes nowadays. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. So you have to be an excellent people person. That's that's the first thing. Right. You have to be you have to be a, a, a competent photographer. You don't have to be the world's best photographer, but you have to be competent enough so that you can give advice to people and make it sound believable. Yep. Um, and you, you you have to have obviously an intimate knowledge of the of the area as well. And I'm not talking about geographical knowledge. I'm talking about photography knowledge. So mm -hmm. knowing, um, you know, which location is going to work in which conditions and at which time of day. And it's, you know, it, it's almost as important to know where all the toilets are as it <laughs> is to know where the photography locations are. Because you've got a group of 10 people, someone always needs the toilet. And, and so you can't be driving 20 miles out of the way just so that you can go to the toilet all the time. So, yeah, all these things have to be factored in. And you, people have no idea because you never announce at the beginning of the day, right, we're going to go here and then we're going to go here because there's a toilet here. You just happen to be passing it and you say to everybody right there's a toilet here there's not another one for another two hours so go even if you don't want to go right and pe people don't realize that that's not just by chance we haven't just driven past the toilet by chance it's all planned because i know full well that if we don't drive past the toilet someone will then go i need the toilet and then that's the afternoon's photography ruin because we've got to drive an hour out of our way to go and find one <laughs> uh, we could talk about that kind of stuff probably for hours <laughs> exactly but it, it's it, it's amazing that and, and I, i'm not saying that it, it should be obvious to people but to anybody who doesn't work in that field you've got no idea how much work is involved and what it takes and like you say there's very few people that could do it you know if i if i had to um you know add somebody to my team who had all the all the skills that I was looking for I'd find it really difficult because it's not just a case of you know advertising it and just accepting somebody who who applied it would be really difficult to find the right right people and even then you have to yeah there's there's probably a year's worth of training before they they actually become useful in terms of you can delegate work to them and and trust that they're going to do it and so it's yeah, it's, a, it's really important to have a team. And I'm lucky because I, I have a team that have been with me for, um, well, I, I mean, Ruth's the, the latest addition to the team and she's been with me since 2019. So, um, yeah, that's four years. Yeah. So, um, yeah, everyone else has been with me for seven, eight, nine years. And, um, yeah, they, they can all do it with their eyes closed, but not because it's easy, just because they're, they've been doing it for long enough that they, you know, they can do it. Love it. Well, I had one more topic I wanted to throw out there. Um, something that you brought up uh, that as a topic that you wanted to discuss and uh, just a trigger warning for listeners who are sensitive to this particular <laughs> subject. Um, you know, I've said this before, but like it is a topic that gets discussed frequently on the podcast in terms of, you know, digital manipulation and I know a lot of listeners are sick and hear sick of hearing it. So if you're one of those listeners, you can just you know skip to the next episode or whatever you want to do. <laughs> whatever no, no, you... stick ar stick around because what I've got to say about it is <laughs> you're going to want to hear. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, so I just wanted to put that little um, disclaimer on there. So at the risk of beating a dead horse, um, I know you had a strong interest in discussing uh, your thoughts and opinions uh, relating to authenticity in photography. Uh, why is this important from your personal perspective? Okay, so the, the thing that really gets me is when people claim or imply that an image is authentic and it's clearly not. And so basically they're, they're lying. Now, my, my own personal approach to my own photography, it's, it's only my own photography, I don't push this on other people whatsoever, but I'm a, a, a purist as much as anybody can be a purist I won't change an image at all I will never clone anything out I will never add anything in but that doesn't mean to say that I think it's wrong that's just my that, that's just the way I am now when it comes to landscape photography um, and certainly wildlife photography and I would say travel photography as well I think that it's really important that those three genres are replicated as natural environments because if you're taking a picture of a landscape what you're doing is you're photographing nature now it's called nature because it's natural okay so why not keep it natural in a photo now 
there's lots of people that will say, well, you know, photography is, is an art form and, you know, it's the same as painting. Yeah, that's fine. But what really gets me is when people take a photo, I can see that it's not a real photo or it's been so heavily processed that it doesn't replicate anything close to what it would have looked like had the person been standing there at the same time. Um, and there's a there's a, either an imp a heavy implication or a, an outright claim that this is a genuine photo, and that really bothers me because it's basically just lying. And it's I've I've been on a you know last year when I was working on content for this year's show, I came up with an idea called photo detectives. And what this is, is as well as our recorded show for Photography Online, which goes out every month, which is free for every, everybody to watch on YouTube. We also have a live show, which is only uh, for our supporters. So we have a, a supporter package. Um, and for everybody who supports us, we re reward them with an extra show, which also is a monthly show, but it's a live show because we don't have time to be creating other recorded content. So it's normally about 90 minutes, and that 90 minutes will typically take about three hours of pre-production. Um, and then of course we've got the 90 minutes itself. So overall, it's about, uh, I don't know, four or five hours worth of work. So it's manageable. Um, but one of the features in this show is called Photo Detectives. And it's when we look at photos, we analyze photos, most of which I've found online. And I say to people, right, this is a fake photo and this is why. And all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to educate people on how to spot fake photos. And because I've been on the hunt for these photos, um, and I mostly find them on social media, um, I've been kind of getting a bit of a reputation um, online <laughs> for calling people out. Um, uh, and people, you know, some people get a bit sort of put out by it. But a huge amount of people have said to me, please keep doing this because it's really important because I'm fed up with all the lying that's going on. And so it's not just me doing this. I think people, I, the analogy I always use is that when you, go, when you go to the cinema or you watch a film, if that film is based on a true story, chances are the first thing you're gonna see in that film is some text and it says, based on a true story. Now, the reason they put that there is because the default assumption when you go and watch a movie is that you're going to watch a work of fiction mm -hmm. and so if it's not a work of fiction the director producer whoever will think okay if we tell people that this is a real story it will heighten their appreciation for this for the plot and for the storyline otherwise why would they do it it, ha it has to be an advantage to tell people that this is a true story otherwise they wouldn't do it because that they don't have to do it when you look at a photo a photograph your default assumption or the viewer's default assumption, certainly until now, but I think this is going to change going forward because of AI, is that what you're looking at is a record of something that actually happened. And so I think that if what you're looking at didn't actually happen, it should be, it should be announced. This is not a genuine photo. And there's nothing wrong with that. People can do whatever they want with their photos. They can, they can photograph rainbows going over the moon with a unicorn flying through the air. Do whatever you want. There's nothing wrong with it. It's your work. You can do whatever you want. But don't try and put a rainbow into a photo or put a moon, superimpose a moon rising behind some mountains when it wasn't really there and then pretend that it was by either saying that it was a genuine photo or just in, by not saying anything at all and just implying that it was a genuine photo because that's lying to people and it's deceiving people. And I think that the whole AI thing is going to make people a lot more um, thirsty for authentic photography. Well, uh, I'm guessing you've never listened to this podcast before because you basically, <laughs> you basically just regurgitated something that I've been saying for the last seven years on this show. So, I mean, I don't need to like go into detail to say that I agree 100% with what you just said because I obviously do. Listeners also already know that I do. In fact, you may or may not be aware, but I actually partnered with Tim Parkin and a couple other people to create an entire competition for landscape photography mm -hmm. for this very purpose called the Natural Landscape Photography Awards, because all of the awards mm -hmm. that we were seeing being handed out are of images that have been completely 
um, manipulated in Photoshop mm-hmm. to not represent, yep. you know, what was actually, you know, witnessed by the photographer. So it's something I personally highly value as well. Um, I wrote a very, very, very extensive article on my website two or three years ago called Lying About Landscape Photography that kind of laid out everything you just said, only in like way more detail. <laughs> yeah. And I got to tell you, I got a ton of backlash from writing that article. There's of, a... course, no, of course you're going to get because, you know, but that's that's the beauty of, of, of mankind, isn't it? That if, if we were all interested in the same thing and we had the same opinion, then life would be boring. So we have to we have to all be you know different in some way. But I can only I can only say what my personal attitude is. But I do know that it's shared by a lot of people, including yourself, of course, a lot of people. I can look at an image and you would be able to do this as well because we have the expertise to be able to analyze something and go that's not right it might be the the angle of light it might be a a focal uh, you know a focal length clash so for example if you saw um, you know a scene where the main scene was clearly you know something shot about 24 millimeters or 35 millimeters and yet you've got this massive moon behind the mountain, which is typically two to 300 millimeters. You right. go, right, well, that's impossible. But somebody without our level of expertise, just you know, the Joe public who's looking, flicking through Facebook or Instagram or whatever, and they're not a photographer, they look at that and they go, wow, look at that moon, it's massive. And they don't understand that it's physically impossible because they haven't got the expertise to, to decode that. So. The whole idea of photo detectives is to educate people and say, right, this is rubbish because you can't have a full moon in that position because the, the angle of the light's wrong. So if you, you know, I'll give you an example. There's a, a photo that we're gonna use where you've got um, a mountain range and there's side light coming on the mountains and behind the mountains is a full moon. That's physically impossible, right? <laughs> because if the mountains are being side lit, the moon Hello. has to be being side lit as well. But if people don't understand how the the solar system works, and, and there's plenty of people who don't, um, and they you know they don't have expertise in photography and angles of light, they they look at that and they go, well, why is how do you know it's not genuine? And once you can apply the laws of physics to it and explain to people that's physically impossible, that cannot happen then they'll go, okay, and then they'll be able to look at images themselves and go, ah, I now know that that's a fake image because you know, of what I saw on photography online. That's just one example. I mean, there's, there's a million examples, but the idea is, is that we'll look at five or six examples per show, and then by the end of the year, hopefully people will be you know, reasonably clued up on what, you know, what's fake and what's genuine. Have what kind of backlash have you received from? I mean, I'm thinking from the people you pick out too. Like, what kind of, what's some of the negative well, ramifications of what's happening here? The the, the 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 classic one that I always get is, um, you know, this is not new. Ansel Adams was dodging and burning and doing all sorts of stuff in the dark room at 60 years ago, and I say, yeah, he was, and he wrote a book about it, and he admitted it. That's the key. You can do whatever you want, okay, to your images, but admit it. Ansel Adams never lied about his photos. He never went, I didn't change it at all. It's exactly how I saw it. It's exactly replicated the scene exactly. That's never what he said. He wrote books about how he spent hours and hours and hours in the darkroom, dodging and burning to create the, the right exa- result. He even cloned things out and put things in. But he admitted it openly and wrote books about it. So that's the worst example that you could possibly give because I'm not for one minute saying that you shouldn't manipulate photos. I'm saying that I don't manipulate photos, but I'm not saying that you can't manipulate photos. All I'm saying is that if you do do it, at least be open and honest about it. And if you're not open and honest about it, what are you trying to hide? Because if you're, if you superimpose a massive moon behind some mountains, then it probably means that the original shot of the mountains wasn't good enough without the moon in it. And so you've thought, okay, no one's going to like this photo. Um, so I've got to cheat and make it more impressive somehow. So I'm going to put a massive moon behind it because that will get people's attention. And then I'll just pretend that it was real. Well, that's lying to people. That's not right. So I, the whole purpose of this is just to educate people on spotting the, the telltale signs. And there's, you, there's not always a telltale sign. Sometimes I'll look at an image and I think, 
I can't prove that that's not, re that's not real, but my instinct tells me that it's probably not. But I've been wrong a couple of times. I've called out a couple of people and I've said, um, you know, that's not real. Why are you pretending it is? And, uh, and they've proved to me that it, it, it was real. And then I say, oh, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. But that's a very, very small percentage. I mean, 1%. 99 percent I, I get it right and i would say talking about of percentages i know everyone's feed on their social media is different and i, I can only talk about mine but i would say that probably 95 percent of the photos that i see online are fake and what I, what kind of world do we live in hmm. when how, how are future generations okay going to judge us when they look back on the you know in say 2300 when they look back on the early early 20th century and they go well we can't take any of their photos as an example of history because they would they faked them back in those days <laughs> you know it's funny because um you know one of the things that frustrates me about this whole debate um similar to what you said is you know it doesn't necessarily bother me that people are doing that kind of stuff like knock yourself out right but it's always, the, the, I find those photographs are almost always paired with kind of this bombastic, um, over-exaggerated, flowery text about the experience that the photographer had, about how yeah. incredible and how it I, was. how I nearly died. Yeah, yeah how I, know, ri just, I risked my life to take this shot. Right, and like, and you know, just how beautiful it was to witness that sunset, which by the way, wasn't even part of the photograph. You know, all of these... <laughs> All of these things that people do to to um, mm -hmm. to exaggerate the photograph, and it to me, it, I, yep. it just it looks and feels desperate. It, um, like you say, well, it's, it is it's but... li lying to people intentionally for what purpose? I mean, so ask the, ask the question. What's the the key question here? Is why do they do it? Exactly. Well, I, I know the answer. But I'm asking you why you think they do. Oh, it. I wrote a whole essay about this, but um, okay. I mean, I think people do it for lots of reasons. Psychologically, people seek attention, you know. Uh -huh. when, you yeah. know people like that dopamine hit they get from social media when they post an image and it gets likes and comments and shares and all of that stuff. They love all the positive feedback they're getting from other people about how beautiful the photograph is. Um, exactly. some, people are doing it, some people are doing it for monetary and personal gain. I mean, I know, I've, I know countless examples of people who composite images um specifically for the purpose of selling a workshop to a location um and then and then using that photograph to advertise a workshop to me that yeah. feels incredibly disingenuous so i think people are doing it for selfish reasons for the most part <laughs> uh, no absolutely entirely selfish reasons and it's all it's all um attention seeking um and i just think it's uh, you know it's a it's a sad kind of situation of where we are as like you know, modern society really that in order to get that you know self sort of gratification that you have to to cheat and 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 lie i just i just think it's sad i i, I think that people would find it more far more gratifying and satisfying if they spent as much time trying to learn how to take a proper photo than creating fake ones by sitting in front of a computer, get out and, and use your camera a bit more. Well, um, a lot of the people that make those kind of images are very good photographers. You know, they're just taking it to the whole next level. <laughs> well, and the, the other thing that, that what this does, and this, this is going to happen because, because of AI really, but AI is no different to people photoshopping their, their images to the point where they don't resemble what the actual scene was like anyway. But What's going to happen is, uh, you know, my daughter's 11 at the moment. She, I, I already have noticed that she will look at a photo and her default position is it's fake hmm. because everything is fake to her. And so we've got this whole generation uh, of people growing up now and they're going to be subjected to AI, you know, videos as well as photos. And they're just going to be um, very skeptical about everything going forwards. Um, and what it does is it damages authentic photography because when somebody does go out and they put in the effort to get a photo, and I'll give you a, an example in a minute, um, what happens is that people will just look at that photo and go, well, that wasn't real. 
And then why is the person just putting all that effort to go out of their way and, and, uh, and get that you know, amazing photo that they could have got within five minutes of just sitting at a computer and just typing in prompts into a, you know, an AI image generator. But they've actually gone out and got the photo. But the, the thanks they get for that is just loads of people going, well, that's obviously fake. So the example, the example I'm gonna give you is um, as a guy called Stephen Maddow. Now I've never heard of him before, but I've, his photo, one of his photos popped up on my Facebook feed about three or four days ago. And it's of a, a rocket taking off right in front of the moon. Oh, and I think I saw that. Yeah. It's a beautiful image. And I looked at it at first and I thought, hmm, I've got, I've got a suspicion about this one. Right. And the, reason, the, the, the main reason I had a suspicion was because not only is that incredibly difficult to do because yes, you know where the moon is, but you don't know where that rocket's gonna be. You don't know the tra tra trajectory of that rocket. So how do you know where to stand? And it's not like rockets go off every five minutes. I mean, right. I don't know. <laughs> You know, I don't know how many launches there are every month, but it's going to be countable on one hand. Um, and so you don't get many chances of, you know, a rocket flying in front of the moon. So to be in the right place at the right time, because it wasn't a, a, um, a grab shot, it wasn't a coincidence. The guy actually went out and tried to, to get it. But what made me a bit suspicious was the fact that the orientation of the rocket was absolutely perfect. So it because it's got two boosters on each side so you've got the main rocket in the middle and two boosters on each side and if if it had been one degree rotated either way it wouldn't have been as good a photo because you wouldn't have seen separation between the boosters and the main rocket mm -hmm. and that's what made me suspicious and i thought the chances of the chances of that happening are so remote that it makes me highly suspicious that this is real, but I couldn't prove that it wasn't real. So I contacted the guy and, and I said, um, I just seen your photo, amazing photo. Can you tell me a bit more about it? Is it a genuine photo? And I told him about photography online. I told him about this uh, photography detectives thing. And I said, look, if it is a genuine photo, I'd really like you to come on and tell us about it and tell us about the work that goes into it to make people appreciate what it takes to get a photo like this that you could have got in five minutes on the computer. Mm -hmm. um, and he's come back and he's explained exactly everything that he, all the preparation that he did. And I, I haven't had a chance to ask him about the orientation of, of, the, of the rocket yet, because that must have been just amazing luck. But, uh, but as far as I can tell, it's a, it's a genuine photo. And what the modern world has done is it just means that it's belittled his, his, the effort that he's put into it. Because if that had been 10 years ago, people would have looked at that and gone, that's the most amazing image I've ever seen in my life. But now people will just skip past it and they'll just go, yeah, I've seen it. Because they see more, more impressive things all the time, but they're fake. That's the difference. This is real. Right. Yeah, I mean, and that's what I love about the competition we created is any image that gets to the final judging and any image that gets into our books, uh, they've been, we have the raw file. We can compare the before and mm. after to see how the image was created and to compare like what all it was done to it and did it adhere to our strict rules and all of that stuff. So when someone sees a photograph in our competition and it's been, you know, it makes mm. it into our book or whatever, like they can trust that it has actually, is actually an image that someone captured legit. <laughs> can, I, can I make a suggestion just in case you think it's good? Okay, for, for, for your competition. Sure. And that is to publish the raw file next to the photo. Yeah, we, I mean, we've thought about it for sure. Because if, if, you, if you announce that right from the, right the get-go and people know that, they, that, that their raw photo will be published next to the edited photo, then it will change massively what people enter. Potentially. I mean, what we've found is people are really worried about being disqualified. So they, I mean, we've only had a small handful of images that we were like, okay, this doesn't meet our requirements. I mean, mm -hmm. it's actually been pretty nice. Mm -hmm. but, but, but an image can still meet your requirements and, and be relatively heavily edited, you know, changes in contrast, changes in saturation, sure. et cetera. And it still might meet your criteria, but I think it will be interesting for the viewer to be able to see 
the original raw file next to the edited version just so that they can see you know how much because you know i've taken photos before digitally where you look at the raw file and you sit in front of the computer and you kind of think well what can i change about this there's nothing that needs to be changed and you, and you don't end up making any changes at all it's very rare that that happens and it's got nothing to do with the with how good a photographer you are it just happens to be that the conditions mm -hmm. were absolutely perfect that no manipulation is required or ma manipulation is a bad word no editing is required um so but that, that's a very rare scenario but there's other times where you you know will take a photo and you're purposely drastically underexpose it because you're wanting to hold for the highlights mm -hmm. and you know full well that you can pull all the detail back out of the shadows sure but you're if you know that that raw file is going to be presented next to your next to your edited version then you're less likely to enter that as a as a candidate because you even though it meets the criteria you're going to think well i don't want anyone seeing the raw file of that because it's drastically underexposed i just think it would be a, a, a really refreshing way to um you know showcase you know photographer's work i think that might be fun as like a separate category of like how like you know images that like have been very 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 edited very slightly or not at all i think that would mm -hmm. be an interesting like companion to that sort of category mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, well there's it's an obviously an idea that you already had but i just it just popped into my head then and i just thought i've never seen a competition before where they showcase the the raw file next to the edited version so it'd be quite interesting certainly from a photographer's point of view yeah, I mean, some of it is we have to get people's permission, you know, obviously when they enter that yep, we're going to show you raw file, which we haven't done that yet. So we would have to kind of change our terms and conditions, but that's easy. Yeah. 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 Good. All right. Well, Marcus, so last question, who do you recommend for the podcast? Who are some people that we should get to know? Okay. Well, the, uh, there's obviously a long list of people who, you know, I would recommend that you've already had no doubt had on as as guests before so i won't waste time by repeating those but um there's a guy here in the uk called chris sale and um you know I've, i mean he's become a bit of a friend of mine now um but i followed him for a long time before i'd had any communication with him whatsoever and he's an interesting uh case sort of character really because he gave up a quite a lucrative full-time job in uh, Sky Broadcasting. Um, and he, he just had a dream that he wanted to be a full-time landscape photographer. So he quit his job and he just threw everything at it. And um, he, it hasn't been as easy <laughs> as he thought <laughs> uh, for, for various reasons. I mean, you know, no one saw the pandemic coming and, and he, he did it. The, the pandemic happened, I think, on his second year. So, you know, it's incredibly unlucky, bearing in mind that this guy was trying to earn a living from doing workshops uh, right. and what have you. So he's had, you know, loads of hurdles that you could never have foreseen, um, you know, put in, in your way. But he's he's documented his kind of journey quite publicly. Um, but it, I think uh, it's just something that it would make a very good, you know, conversation from the point of view of someone who, um, you know, had the, the dream of, being a, a full-time photographer, which obviously many people do, um, but having the guts to actually go through and do it and then coming out the other side and it not being, you know, as, as easy as he, as he thought. Um, so I think he's just got a, a few good stories to tell. So he'd be one, Chris Sale. Um, have you ever had Matt Marash on? I have not. Okay, so are you aware of Matt Marash? I'm not. Okay, well, uh, apart from his first name, he's quite a nice guy. <laughs> um, and um, no, Matt Marash, he's, he's um, uh, US based. I think he's from Cleveland, somewhere, Ohio, somewhere up there. Um, he's mostly a large format uh, photographer, but he really knows his stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, he, he'd be a, a good guest because he can, he can talk uh, about some very interesting topics. Um, and then the other guy, um, I don't know him at all, but um, I just find him quite interesting, is a guy called Robbie Maynard, another US-based photographer. Um, I've heard him on a couple of podcasts, and he's just a very good talker. He's very interesting to listen to. So um, those three people, I think, would be, uh, would be good to, to have on the show. Brilliant. And Marcus, how do people learn more about you and photography online? How can they get involved in that? Okay, well, we've 
we've obviously got lots of different brands and it gets all very confusing because we've got Sky Photo Academy, we've got Worldwide Explorers, we've got Photography Online. Um, and so there's a parent company, like an umbrella company, which is called MC2 Photography. So it's just the letter M and then the C as in, you know, Mook, because my surname is McAdam. Uh, and then the number two and then photography. So mc2photography.com. Um, if you go to that website, it's got links to everything. So there's, there's information about the Photography Online show, uh, there's information about the, the trips that we do um, and everything else. And there's, you know, there's even a shop there to buy you know, products. So, so we sell tripods and filters and everything. And not because we make money on them, but it's just I was fed up with um, people contacting me saying, oh, what's the tripod that you're using? What's the, so I, I now sell them from the, from the shop. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a good website to have a look at. There's um, some you know interesting um, articles on there to read. Um, so yeah, mc2photography.com is the the kind of the one place where you can get everything in in one go really. I love it, well, Marcus. This has been super fun. I look forward to hanging out with you and all of your awesome people in 2025. And I really appreciate you taking the time to talk about what you do. No, I've enjoyed it. So thank you very much for your time. Absolutely. Well, thank you to Marcus for joining us on the podcast this week. I had a great time speaking with you and I wish you the best of luck with the YouTube channel. I think a lot of people are going to find value in your show. So keep up the good work. I'm always interested in hearing stories from our listeners or perhaps counter arguments to strong positions or views that have been shared by me or previous guests. If you're interested in joining me for a chat or perhaps a debate, I'm always open to it. So don't be afraid to reach out. I've got a link in the show notes for you to do just that. And of course, as always, if you find this content helpful or entertaining, I always appreciate your support on Patreon. Okay, that's all for now. Thanks for stopping in, collaborating with us, and listening. See you next week.